Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Apologies, I had to log back into Zoom really quickly. Um, and uh, I am very honored uh, to invite Dr. Jose Romero, who's going to be speaking uh, to us just very briefly to provide a few comments about the respiratory disease surge that had happened um, this past winter in the U.S. So, Dr. Romero, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Thank you, members. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is actually one of the more enjoyable things I get to do. Um, um, it really is a pleasure to be here um, in the role of the director of the Center for, uh, sorry, the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases. Um, having previously served as a member and chair of the CDC's uh, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, I truly understand and greatly appreciate the time and effort required by its members to convene uh, a meeting of the ACIP. Over the course of the meeting, um, the committee will hear presentations on influenza and COVID-19 vaccines, as well as uh, novel RSV vaccines. Um, and uh, to set the scene for the next few sessions, I want to give a brief overview of uh, the co-circulating respiratory viruses uh, that we observed over uh, the winter and fall, and uh, highlight uh, how they are of critical importance uh, in the terms of vaccination. So this past fall and winter, as you all know, the United States saw a high co-circulation of respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, influenza virus, and SARS-CoV-2. Uh, these put significant stress on our healthcare systems and our drug supply chain. After a brief and anticipated uptake of, uptake of hospitalizations and cases over the, around the holidays, we are now seeing uh, a continued decrease um, in um, in COVID, influenza, and RSV cases and hospitalizations nationally. For those of you that are pediatricians, and I heard uh, Dr. Lee mentioning that there are a lot of uh, pediatric infectious disease persons on, this, on the committee, but for those of you who, who are not, um, RSV is a well-recognized respiratory pathogen of infants uh, and a common cause of respiratory disease in older adults. Uh, in adults, RSV can be difficult to differentiate from COVID-19 and influenza based on symptoms alone and is frequently overlooked um, as a diagnosis uh, for a respiratory, uh, viral respiratory disease uh, in adults. In the elderly or in those with certain comorbid conditions, RSV infections can be significant and life-threatening. Typically, adults experience mild cold-like symptoms uh, that although some can uh, develop a lower respiratory tract infection, such as pneumonia. Older adults, adults with chronic heart and lung con conditions or diseases, and those with weakened immune systems are at higher risk for severe RSV infections. RSV is also known uh, to lead to worsening of chronic conditions common in adults, such as asthma, congestive heart failure, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Each year in the United States, it's estimated that between 60,000 and 160,000 hospitalizations occur, and 6 to 10,000 deaths result in older adults due to RSV infections. This past fall, the CDC uh, surveillance team saw an increase in RSV detections, RSV-associated emergency room department visits, and hospitalizations, including among older adults. Current national trends for RSV activity indicate that it has returned to baseline levels. For seasonal influenza, the activity continues to decline across the country. While influenza activity is declining, it remains possible that a second wave may occur later in the season as it has in the past. CDC has responded to the increase in co-circulating respiratory viruses in multiple ways. But I think the most important to bring before you is that in January, CDC released two new respiratory disease surveillance dashboards that are accessible not only to public health, medical, but also to the public in general. The first is the Respiratory Virus Hospitalization Surveillance Network, RSV, uh, RESPnet. It's an interactive dashboard. It displays data on respiratory virus-associated hospitalizations from three existing surveillance platforms, that is COVIDnet, flu, flu ServNet, and RSVnet. The second dashboard is the National Emergency Department visits for COVID-19, influenza, and respiratory syncytial virus. And it displays data on emergency room visits for, 
for multiple respiratory conditions as tracked by the National Syndromic Surveillance Program, or NSSP. And now you know why we like a lot of alphabet soup in the CDC. The dashboard presents uh, data captured from approximately 75% of all emergency departments in the United States, so it has very robust database. These dashboards allow users to easily see hospitalizations and emergency department data from, for these three viruses by age and track and compare the trends for SARS-CoV-2, influenza, and RSV disease. And if you haven't had a chance to go on there, please do. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can do and, and filter for. Uh, there's a lot of information that you can gather from these. The recent outbreaks highlight why we must remain vigilant about prevention. CDC continues to conduct outreach to clinicians, public health, and school partners, and the public to raise awareness about the importance of vaccination for COVID-19 and influenza for everyone six months and older. During today's sessions, there will be presentations and discussion on pediatric, maternal, and RSV vaccines that may become available for the prevention of RSV-related disease in the near future. Since the detection of the first case of SARS-CoV-2 virus over three years ago, more than one million Americans, including 2,000 children, have tragically died as a result of COVID-19 infection. Nearly six million individuals have been hospitalized and many more continue to suffer from long COVID conditions. Fortunately, due to the rapid development of safe and effective vaccines, we are in a very different position today than we were three years ago. COVID-19 vaccines have presented, prevented millions of severe illnesses, hospitalizations, and deaths since their introduction in December of 2020, and many of you were on the committee at that time. Today, 80% of Americans have received at least one dose of the primary COVID-19 vaccine series, and over 667 million doses of the vaccine have been administered. However, despite the introduction of a bivalent booster in September of last year, uptake has been low, with only 15% of the U.S. population having received an updated booster, and even lower numbers for pediatric patients. Vaccinations and antivirals continue to be the best protection against serious illness for COVID-19. Unfortunately, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we saw a concerning drop in routine immunizations for both adults and children. Routine vaccinations are rebounding, although, although unevenly, um, and have yet to fully recover in all groups. A significant and extremely concerning example is that the percentage of uninsured children not vaccinated by their second birthday was recently found to be eight times that of privately insured children. And that is even in the face of VFC, a program that is designed to address these inequities uh, in healthcare access, in healthcare um, uh, insurance. While we continue to investigate the impact of the pandemic on routine immunizations, it is imperative that we take steps to help get everyone back on schedule and back on track with their routine immunizations. We must continue to work together to improve vaccination coverage, reducing barriers, increasing access, and strengthening vaccine confidence. For influenza and COVID-19, safe and effective licensed or authorized vaccines are currently available for the prevention of serious disease. It is very possible that in the not too distant future, Americans may also have options for the prevention of a third respiratory virus, that is, respiratory syncytial virus. Thank you very much, and good luck on your deliberations and discussions. Thank you so much, Dr. Romero. I'd, I'd be happy to open this presentation for questions, but I did just want to emphasize Dr. Romero's um, key points. Uh, number one, that context is everything. So for those of us who have um, families with kids or with older adult members, many of us have had um, multiple respiratory viral illnesses this winter. Um, and then on top of it, for those of us who are pediatric providers, uh, we had such a significant surge, respiratory surge during a period of time, um, all due to multiple respiratory illnesses, that we actually uh, had to divert and redirect many of the children who were really ill and needed care. Um, and that's not even all the other children who needed to come in for other reasons. So it has a huge impact on our healthcare delivery system. It has a huge impact on families. And the reason we um, are grateful to Dr. Romero for being willing to speak about uh, this context is that um, for the 
first time that I can remember in a long time, we have the opportunity today uh, to review data on influenza vaccines, on RSV vaccines. We've already, and we will discuss COVID vaccines and also pneumococcal vaccines. And all of those are important preventive measures uh, for us to consider as part of a potential you know, respiratory disease prevention platform. So while we will take into consideration each of these uh, vaccines on an individual basis, it's also just important for us to think through um, the broader implementation context, both for young children and for older adults, to ensure that as we're making these recommendations, we're also thinking ahead to how these programs would be deployed in uh, the various populations. Um, and with that, I'd just like to invite any comments or questions from ACIP members, if you have any. You have Dr. Romero's attention right now, so <laughs> I highly recommend taking, taking advantage of it. Dr. Lair. Could you repeat, you said, I, I heard something about eight times a difference. Could you clarify? So, so yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about that, I think, tomorrow or the, uh, tomorrow, uh, and give you more specific numbers. But yes, um, so the, the difference is eight times um, between that, those children that have, um, so uh, the percentage of uninsured, I'll repeat it just to be certain, the percentage of uninsured children not vaccinated by their second birthday um, was recently found to be eight times that of privately insured children. And, you know, to me, the number itself is, is, is significant, but think about it in the, in the context of having a VFC program, right? That program was, was, was created to deal with inequities in insurance and, and, and access and, 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 and racial and ethnic barriers, right? And so if that is in place and functioning as well as it has been pre-pandemic, and we have this eight times difference, there is a major problem. Um, and tomorrow I'll talk also about this, but this is particularly severe also, not just in those in poverty, but those in rural America, where, where, where data shows that we have lower rates of vaccination in that group, right? Um, and, and whether it's, in, and, and again, with, that, with VFC, is that an access problem, or is it another issue that, we, that we're not addressing? Dr. Talbot. This may be more of a soapbox than a question. <laughs> um, I'll just say that up front. It's very exciting to see viral vaccines coming for older adults. Um, unfortunately, vaccines are complicated in adults over 65 because of Medicare. Um, are there any processes in the work to streamline vaccines under Medicare Part B so that physicians can give those vaccines while the patients are in clinic? I, I, I can't say that there are processes in, pl in, in, in place, but there are discussions. And, and Melinda, do you want to offer some comment about that? Uh, so. Um, there, there have been some recent changes in policy with the, uh, with recent legislation. Uh, is Mary Beth Hance still on? I am. Yeah, it, it, Mary Beth, could you, um, uh, would you be able to make some brief comments either now or in your agency update tomorrow about the um, uh, changes to Medicare vaccine um, reimbursement issues under Medicaid, Medicare Part B and D from the Inflation Reduction Act? Sure. So that was going to be my update tomorrow. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I can, um, let me just get to, um, hold on one second. Let me just get to my visual really quickly. I can um, give a quick update and then you all can just pretend when you hear it again tomorrow that you haven't already heard it. Um, so the inflation, as Melinda said, the Inflation Reduction Act um, made changes to coverage of to coverage of vaccines for adults in Medicare. Um, for Part B, it added COVID nineteen as a Part B, as in boy covered vaccine, and then for Part D, as in David. It made um, it meant that there is no cost sharing for patients, and that started on January first. So again, the um, the Part B vaccines are flu, pneumococcal, hepatitis B for individuals who are at high and intermediate risk, 
and um, COVID-19 vaccines, and then vaccines that are reasonable and necessary to treat an injury or exposure to a disease. And then the Part D vaccines, there's now coverage of um, ACIP recommended vaccines with no cost sharing under Part D, the remaining. And I apologize, I did not catch the very first question about Part B. Um, so if this did not answer it, if no, you the, want the, to. You, you answered the question, thank you. Okay. And, um, and I, I think that it will be good to revisit this tomorrow because it's really important. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Romero. So uh, if you'll permit me one other comment. So w while this does benefit those with, with insurance, there is still a large population in the United States of adults that do not have insurance. Um, and so, you know, serious consideration for a program that would offer vaccine to those individuals, such as VFA, modeled in some way after VFC, is a consideration I think that the American public needs to consider um, as we move forward in order to catch all Americans up to vaccinations and make of these vaccinations available to all. Thank you, Dr. Romero. Dr. Daly. Um, so just to follow on that um, sort of one big picture question, Dr. Romero, and then one process question. The big picture question is, what do we know about vaccination rates for adults without insurance? <clears throat> is there a comparable figure for influenza vaccination or for COVID vaccination? And then, and then what, um, what's required for a vaccines for adults program? Is it, is it congressional legislation? Um, so thank you. Yes, yeah, so, so the, there, there are data, and, and I can give you specific data uh, tomorrow when I talk again. But I, I can tell you that, that um, it is substantially lower. So without vaccination, it is substantially lower. And I, I, I don't have those, those memorized, uh, but, but they are. Um, and, and, and so it's very important uh, to, to, for them to have this coverage. They, they don't get inf routine influenza vaccine. Even the copay, for example, can be a deterrent to access to vaccines. So those individuals that have insurance and, and have to pay the copay will forego their vaccination for influenza. So we have data at different scenarios. So what is necessary for VFA? It needs to be appropriated for within the president's budget. It has to be legislated by Congress. Um, and so yeah, that, that, it has to go through those processes. Thank you. Um, Dr. Goldman. Oh, no, so apologies. Oh, no, we're good, Dr. Daly. Okay, Dr. Goldman. Thank you so much. And Dr. Romero, thank you for your hard work in this update. This is probably a rhetorical question, but does is it within the CDC's purview or what can be done to handle certain state jurisdictions uh, deliberately putting out disinformation regarding the safety and efficacy of the vaccines? Dr. Goldman, it's good to hear from you again, and it's always a pleasure to see you take the bull by the horns. Um, so, it, CDC, as always, is engaged with educating the public and providing information that is scientifically correct and sound. Um, it is not the not within the the, the 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 realm of CDC to actively involve itself within jurisdictions. So, simply put, these are decisions made by the jurisdiction or jurisdictions involved. Um, we are available to, prevent, to present the data as it actually sits. Thank you, Dr. Goldman and Dr. Romero. Um, Dr. Hogue. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I appreciate the comments and I'm struck by the um, the inequities that still exist in our society, and and we should all do all we can to address them. I, I want to also just make a comment um, on the Part D and Part B uh, vaccination component. Um, uh, America's pharmacies are having some significant issues with the Part D plans and the inconsistency with which the Part D plans cover the administration of the vaccines. Um, they treat the vaccines as drugs because they have an NDC number, 
But many of the Part D plans either try to bundle uh, the administration fee with the vaccine for administrative simplification, or they pay very little or no administration fee at all, very inconsistent. And my concern with that is that during the pandemic, we've become quite dependent upon community-based pharmacies to improve access points, especially in rural areas of the country. Uh, if the Part D plans um, are not held to account by CMS to consistently pay a meaningful administration fee and stop uh, clawbacks, uh, which are very common in the pharmacy world for drugs, uh, we may wind up with a situation of pharmacies being unable to offer vaccines for Medicare beneficiaries under the Part D plan in the future. So I want to raise this awareness, maybe a little bit of an alarm bell, so that our colleagues at CMS will work with us to try to correct this situation in the coming Part D call letter. Thank you for your comment, Dr. Hogue. Um, and with that, I, I do want to thank Dr. Romero for sharing this information with us today and just for sitting with us for a little bit of extra time to talk about some of the conversations um, ahead. So uh, we will now uh, move on to the influenza session. And Dr. Kip Talbot, who is chair of the Influenza Vaccine Workgroup, will provide an introduction and overview of today's agenda. Sorry, I'm trying to make my screen big so I can see. <laughs> I know. Well, I'll get it here. It's okay. We'll be fine. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk about my favorite virus. Um, unfortunately, it did return this year, as Dr. Romero said, um, so we'll have a lot to talk about. All right. Next slide. Please. Okay, perfect. All right, so this is the um, fabulous team that meet very regular, meet regularly um, to discuss flu and flu vaccine policy. Next slide. So we're going to cover a lot, including today, number one, influenza activity update by Dr. Groskopf. Then we'll also cover the interim influenza vaccine effectiveness against inpatient emergency department and outpatient illness in this um, current season. And that'll be done by Dr. Olson, Lewis, and 1040. We'll talk about interim estimates of influenza vaccine effectiveness from two studies in Wisconsin, and that'll be by Dr. McLean. And then I believe we'll have time. Um, we'll talk about published estimates of the live attenuated influenza vaccine, um, which we have not talked about for a while by Dr. Groskoff. Next slide. Dr. Groskoff. All right, I think this is on. Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is going to be a very brief update of 2022-23 U.S. influenza activity. You can find more information on the networks discussed here and other surveillance networks that CDC um, publishes weekly on FluView on our websites. So what we're going to spend the most time on is actually this one slide. This is a brief summary of virologic surveillance data. Results of influenza positive tests are reported weekly to CDC from a very large network of clinical and public health laboratories. The data on the left are from clinical laboratories and show the percent of influenza tests that were positive, which is one of our indices of influenza activity, by surveillance week on the x-axis for several recent influenza seasons, with the current 2022-23 season represented by the dotted line. For 2022-23, the percent of tests positive peaked in late November, early December at about 26%. As you follow um, further in time, going out to the right on the graph, it's a drop. It's actually been dropping for about the ninth consecutive week to 1.7%. Um, the peak of 26%, as you can see, comparing to the other recent seasons represented on the chart, is roughly comparable. However, just notice that it's shifted to the left earlier in time, um, sort of an earlier peak than is typical. Notice also that it's higher than the two seasons immediately preceding that one, 2020-21, which is sort of along the x-axis there, and 2021-22 in the light blue line. 
From the other component of the system, the public health laboratories, we get a sense of the influenza viral types and subtypes in circulation. H3N2 viruses, which are shown in red on the pie chart, have predominated, although there's also appreciable co-circulation of H1N1 PDMO9-like viruses. Um, you see very little green here. Green is a B viruses. Um, about 99.4% of the viruses characterized thus far have been A, so very little B, at least at this point in the season. So the next two slides we'll be spending a little bit less time on. Um, these are two slides that show surveillance data that come from systems that evaluate lab-confirmed flu-associated outcomes. So this first one here is influenza-associated hospitalizations. Um, lab-confirmed influenza-associated hospitalizations from FluServeNet. Uh, this graph shows cumulative hospitalizations per 1,000 population by surveillance week on the x-axis. For this season, um, that is the line labeled 22-23 all the way over to your left. Um, cumulative hospitalizations have leveled off at about 59.5 per 100,000. Um, and sort of stayed flat in recent weeks. Note, too, here that as in our previous chart, um, the activity has sort of shifted a little bit to the left earlier in the season. So our last surveillance slide, this is the pediatric mortality surveillance system. Um, deaths of children associated with laboratory-confirmed influenza have been uh, reportable in the United States since 2004. This chart represents um, the 2022-23 season on the far right, as well as the immediately preceding three seasons. Thus far as the week ending February 11th, 111 pediatric deaths have been reported through this mechanism. This is unfortunately more than in 2020-21, for which one was reported, and 21-22, for which 45 were reported. So this concludes our slides for surveillance. Just briefly, some summary points. U.S. influenza activity rose early, peaking nationally during late November, early December. The percent of tests positive peaked at about 26 percent. It's currently down to about 1.7 percent. Influenza AH3 and 2 viruses predominated so far with co-circulation of H1N1 pdm 9 The cumulative influenza-associated hospitalization rate has leveled in recent weeks to about 59 per 100,000. We have had 111 influenza-associated pediatric deaths reported thus far this season. Overall influenza activity is increased compared with the previous two seasons. U.S. influenza activity is currently low. And I just want to close by thanking um, the folks on our surveillance team and also those who do FluServe.net for the amazing data they pull together every week. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Groskoff. Are there any quick questions? Uh, I just I have one um, quick question, which is uh, for the pediatric deaths, um, the 111 pediatric deaths you mentioned, is the pattern similar to prior years where approximately 50 percent have no comorbid comorbidities, or do we not know the distribution yet? We, we don't know that yet for this season. It, it takes a little while for that information to come in, but, but about 50 percent, which was published in a 2018 paper from our group, um, is fairly typical. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Daly? Um, do, do we know w why? I mean, <laughs> I realize that's a hard question, but, but why uh, influenza was so early this year? And I guess I'm asking in part for anticipating future years. Um, and I realize it may be a little speculative, but. I, I think that's always difficult to say. Um, flu seasons are unpredictable. And it, it's not the first time we've had a season that early. There, there's actually a, a good chart on um, the web pages that we have um, that cover about 39 flu seasons to date. And there were a couple that peaked as early as October. So there, you know, some of it could be normal. Some of it could be that um, hard to say, honestly. Thank you. Dr. Cotton? It's interesting that the rate of hospitalization, although we had a brisk season, is still pretty low. Do we think that, I don't know if you have any information on this, but do we think this is from better diagnostics, you know, better recognition of viral disease, better use of um, therapeutics? Or maybe you can't answer that from your um, perspective. We, we wouldn't be able to discern that from the type of data we get in the system, but I mean, it, it would certainly be plausible to think, of course, people have, um, I think, uh, lower index of wanting to go get checked out, perhaps, by, by a medical provider if they're not feeling well, given everything we've been through for the last couple of years. Um, and it, 
That, that definitely could be something to do with it. it. It's difficult to know for certain, though, of course. Um, and also, flu seasons do vary in severity. It is interesting to point out that H3 to N2 seasons are generally more severe than H1N1, and that's what we've had the most of so far. But we also appear to have a reasonably good vaccine match this year. So um, as with flu, all things are variable. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the next presentation, uh, Ms. Olson, Dr. Lewis, and Dr. Tenforte on um, the preliminary influenza vaccine effectiveness estimates this year. Thank you. Hello, I'm Sam Olson, an epidemiologist in the influenza division at CDC, and I'll be presenting alongside Nathaniel Lewis and Mark Tenforti on the interim influenza vaccine effectiveness against inpatient emergency department and outpatient illness in the 2022 through 2023 influenza season. Next slide. We use three networks to evaluate the vaccine effectiveness against laboratory-confirmed influenza-associated outpatient visits, emergency department visits, and hospitalization. Next slide. Across all three networks, the methods are similar. We enrolled patients with acute respiratory illness from fall 2022 through early 2023. Each study is a test negative design comparing vaccination odds among case patients with influenza A confirmed by molecular assay versus control patients testing negative for influenza and SARS-CoV-2. Vaccination status was defined as the receipt of any 2022 through 2023 influenza vaccine according to medical records, immunization registries, claims data, and or self-report. For each analysis, vaccine effectiveness was calculated as 1 minus the adjusted odds ratio times 100. Next slide. First, I'll share the findings for the new vaccine surveillance network, or NVSN, that calculated the vaccine effectiveness against influenza-associated hospitalizations and emergency department visits among children 6 months to 17 years of age. Next slide. NVSN conducts active surveillance at seven sites across the country. Next slide. NVSN enrolled inpatient and ED patients aged six months to 17 years with acute respiratory illness within 10 days of illness onset. We enrolled from September 13th to January 25th for this analysis, and we used the test negative design where we considered a patient vaccinated if they received at least one dose, regardless of their age, and relied on verified vaccination or self-report. We used logistic regression for our analysis, adjusting for site, age, and calendar time of admission. Next slide. This slide shows preliminary vaccine effectiveness estimates against pediatric hospitalizations and emergency department visits. Among children six months to 17 years of age, there were 640 influenza positive cases and 2,256 controls included in this analysis. 19% of cases versus 33% of controls received a seasonal influenza vaccine. Overall vaccine effectiveness was 49%. Among our inpatients, a higher point estimate of 68% was observed. And among our emergency department visits, we calculated a vaccine effectiveness of 42%. When stratified by subtype, effectiveness against H3N2 was 45% and against H1N1 was 56%. Next slide. Based on our preliminary estimates for the 2022 through 2023 influenza season, influenza vaccination significantly reduced laboratory confirmed medically attended influenza in children. Effectiveness against pediatric hospitalizations was 68%. Ineffectiveness against pediatric ED visits was 42% and we observed important protection against both H3N2 and H1N1 associated illness. Next slide. We'd like to thank the PIs at each site and each of their teams and our CDC colleagues. Next slide. 
I'll now pass the presentation to Nathaniel Lewis to share the IV results. Thanks so much, Sam. Hi, everybody. My name is Nathaniel Lewis, and I'm a health scientist in the influenza division at CDC. I'm specifically the lead for influenza in the IV network, um, which stands for investigating respiratory viruses in the acutely ill. Uh, in contrast to Sam's presentation, um, we are specifically looking at VE against influenza-associated hospitalization among adults. So this includes persons 18 years of age and older receiving inpatient medically attended treatment for influenza. Next slide. Here is a map of the IV network. Um, this analysis was drawn specifically from patients at 24 medical centers in 19 states. Next slide, please. So the methods uh, used in IV are very similar to what was already described by Sam. Um, also a very similar range of dates, um, just varying by a few days on either side. Here we're specifically looking at October 1st, uh, 2022 through January 31st, 2023. Um, again, this is a case control analysis based on a test negative design. We're looking at odds of vaccination among cases versus among controls. And in this analysis, we adjusted for census region, age, sex, race and ethnicity, and month of illness onset. Next slide, please. So we again see um, some fairly encouraging results here in this analysis of 219 um, cases who tested positive for influenza and 1920, 921 controls who tested negative for both influenza and SARS-CoV-2. Um, vaccination, vaccination coverage was 31% among cases and 43% among controls. Um, overall in the network, we saw a VE of 43%. So that includes all persons age 18 years and older. As expected, we did see some variation by age group uh, with lower protection among those age 65 years and older. Um, of 35% versus 51% among those aged 18 to 64 years old. And importantly, uh, we did see significant protection uh, in the immunocompromised subgroup, um, very similar to that of overall VE in the network, albeit with a wider and um, overlapping confidence interval. And um, our specimen analysis up into the end of 2022 um, showed that among 77 specimens, um, about two thirds of these were H three N two, and the remaining third um, was H one N one. And next slide, please. So I think the important um, takeaway here is that we did see that influenza vaccination significantly reduced um, medically attended hospitalized influenza. Um, at a VE of 43%, and that we did see significant protection in the older adult population and among immunocompromised adults. Next slide, please. And just want to thank um, the individuals who have been working on this analysis iteratively over the course of the season, and um, of course, to the participating institutions in the IV network. Next slide. And, and uh, Mark Mark 1040 is now going to present some results from the Vision Network. Thanks. Great. Thank, thank you, Nathaniel. Um, so I'm, I'm Mark 1040, a medical officer in the influenza division at CDC. I'll be presenting preliminary adult vaccine effectiveness or VE results from the Vision Network, including VE against influenza A associated hospitalizations and emergency department or urgent care visits. Next slide, please. Vision is an electronic vaccine effectiveness network that consists of health systems with integrated laboratory, clinical, and vaccination records. Three partners, including Kaiser Permanente Northern California, Intermountain Healthcare, and Health Partners in four states contributed data for this analysis. Next slide, please. So for this analysis, uh, encounters included emergency department or urgent care visits, 
or hospitalizations between October 15, 2022 and January 24, 2023, among adults who received clinical testing for influenza and had one or more acute respiratory illness or ARI associated discharge codes. Uh, as mentioned by Sam and uh, Nathaniel, using the test negative design, uh, VE was estimated by comparing influenza vaccination odds among patients who tested positive for influenza A versus controls who tested negative for influenza as well as SARS-CoV-2. Vaccine effectiveness models applied inverse propensity to be vaccinated weights and adjusted for potential confounders, including patient age, study site, and calendar time. Next slide, please. This slide shows preliminary VE estimates against adult emergency department or urgent care visits. 14,011 influenza positive cases and 43,196 influenza negative controls were included for this analysis. 23% of cases versus 36% of controls had received a 2022-23 seasonal influenza vaccine. Overall vaccine effectiveness was 44%, including 46% in adults aged 18 to 64 years and 39% in adults aged 65 years or older. A lower point estimate of 30% was seen among adults with immunocompromising conditions. Next slide, please. So this slide shows vaccine effectiveness estimates against adult hospitalizations. 1,760 influenza positive cases and 9,377 influenza negative controls were included in this analysis. 38% of cases versus 49% of controls had received a seasonal influenza vaccine. Overall vaccine effectiveness was 39%, including 29% in adults aged 18 to 64 years and 42% in adults aged 65 years or older. An effectiveness of 31% was seen among adults with immunocompromising conditions. Next slide, please. In summary, through uh, almost the end of January 2023, influenza vaccination significantly reduced laboratory confirmed medically attended flu with an estimated VE of 39% against adult hospitalizations and 44% against adult ED or urgent care visits. Effectiveness was observed across uh, all age groups and in those with immunocompromising conditions. These estimates were higher than Vision Network VE estimates against hospitalization and emergency department or urgent care visits from the same sites during the prior 2021-22 season when mostly vaccine mismatched H3N2 viruses were circulating. A limitation of this analysis was a lack of data to estimate VE by influenza A subtype, including H1 and H3 viruses. Next slide, please. We would like to thank uh, Vision Network collaborators, including the principal investigators at the sites uh, who are listed on this slide, as well as colleagues from uh, CDC and Westat. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So uh, in conclusion, across three flu VE platforms, we observed uh, very consistent influenza vaccine effectiveness during the early 2022-23 influenza season. Vaccination provided substantial protection against inpatient emergency department and outpatient illness across all ages. Influenza vaccination also provided substantial protection among important high-risk groups, including older adults, as well as those with immunocompromising conditions. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, these three presentations are now open for questions. Dr. Romero. No, you anticipated my suggestion, Dr. Lee. Dr. Paling. I want to say thank you to each of the presenters on this important information. Um, if I recall correctly, for persons 65 years and older, we're preferentially recommending the high-dose vaccine. And so I wanted to ask, in the IV envision, do you know roughly what percentage of the persons over 65 had received a high-dose vaccine? Yeah, Lisa, I'm not, not sure if you're... Um able to go to the, the extra slide for vision? I have it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, so this is a breakdown here among those who were vaccinated, um, sort of collapsed by setting 
and had a known uh, vaccine product type. Um, this is a breakdown of the of the products received within uh, different age groups um, uh, uh, for, for vision. So you can see that most uh, 18 to 64 year olds had received uh, standard dose inactivated uh, quadrivalent vaccines, whereas um, among those who were 65 years or older, uh, the, the majority, uh, over 90% received either um, a high dose vaccine or, or adjuvanted vaccine product. And very few received uh, standard dose inactivated vaccine. And I can just add that, um, you know, while we're still waiting for more complete product data for IV, that in the past, um, you know, this breakdown has been fairly similar for IV with the majority of 18 to 64 year olds receiving the standard and um, those 65 and older receiving some kind of enhanced vaccine. Thank you. That's extremely helpful. Any other? Oh, Dr. Sanchez. Well, along with that, do you have the breakdown for the pediatrics to see how many received the nasal um, flu vaccine? The, um, the acellular, the, which one? I'm sorry. The flu mist? LAIV. Yeah. Um, I will defer that question to um, the folks from the network, but my understanding is um, that over, overall in the U.S. networks, the uptake of LAIV within the facilities um, that, that we work with has been low. Yes, I agree um, that the uptake has been low and we don't have those data available yet for um, the new vaccine surveillance network that covered um, the pediatrics in this presentation. Thank you. I don't see any, ad oh, one additional hand raised. Oh, Dr. Lear. Could you um, explain again why you excluded the SARS-CoV-10-2 in, in your analysis and does that change the comparisons to past years? So they had to be negative for influenza and COVID, the, the COVID virus to be part of this analysis. So, so most patients who received influenza testing also received testing for um, SARS-CoV-2. Um, the reason why they were excluded as controls is uh, because there's a potential for con a confounding relationship where um, receipt of influenza vaccination is is correlated with receipt of um, COVID-19 vaccination. So, essentially, you you can enrich your your controls with um, patients who who had um, uh, COVID-19. And potentially resulting in, in bias in your your VE estimates. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other hands or cards raised, so um, we will move on. Oh, one, one. oh, I missed one, Dr. Sanchez. <laughs> Actually, um, Sarah just brought up uh, the deaths. How about the pediatric deaths? Were they any? Do you know have information on the uh, vaccination of them? Um, that that is a really good question. Um, this is something that. Um, the surveillance folks uh, get as much information as they can gather on. We, we don't really know a lot yet about this season. Um, the percent that are completely vaccinated has been roughly stable. It varies a little bit. Um, in the 2018 paper that was published summarizing um, recent season's pediatric deaths at that time, um, only about 22% were fully vaccinated. Sorry, um, seven, seven, 22%. Um, is there anyone from surveillance on, actually? I'll clarify that. The, the, the many are not fully vaccinated. Um, and by fully, we mean two doses or one is appropriate for age. Dr. Lum. This was the year that we thought there was a very good match. And we thought that a poor match previously was responsible for very low efficacy. And it's <clears throat> reassuring somewhat that it's a higher effectiveness than uh, last year, for instance, or the year before, but it still is, for all of us, uh, disappointing after all of this time in annual immunization. And although we're saving lives and saving hospitalizations, we don't want to lose track of that. But to have such a low protection against hospitalization of adults, and I didn't see any protection against death in adults. Uh, maybe I missed it, but I didn't see it. Please tell us, Dr. Talbot, that your group is going to be asked to look at 
new vaccines. Is there anything uh, with, with a totally different approach that we might see? We're not, we don't think at all for a purely respiratory virus that doesn't cause viremia that there's going to be eradication by a vaccine, but a little bit better control of disease uh, would be welcome. Is there anything you're getting to look at? Um, yeah, so you are, you are asking for the holy grail, which we all would like to find. Um, I think one of the unique things about this infection in adults is that adults have been exposed to RSV and flu many times in their life. And we're asking the vaccine to do something that the own human immune system has not quite figured out how to do. Um, so we're asking a lot of a vaccine. Um, I think there are multiple components to this. One is the aging immune system. One of it is the changing virus. Um, and three is that we use a vaccine that is primarily a B cell response. There is some T cell, but there's very little internal protein in our current vaccines that would stimulate the T cells. So, yes, um, there are many scientists. I started in my career when they were looking for the universal influenza vaccine, and my hope is they will find it before I end my career. Um, and hopefully it will have many of those components that you're talking about. But as of yet, um, we still have the vaccine that was developed originally for military recruits. Um, it's a little bit cleaner and less reactogenic than it was when it was first discovered. Um, but it still does, as you point out, prevent a fair number of hospitalizations each year um, and hence deaths. And so we will continue to use it until the Holy Grail appears. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gorskoff. If, if I may just follow up on Dr. Sanchez's question um, the, uh, regarding um, percent fully vaccinated. So in the 2018 paper, which covered deaths of children six months and older between 2010 and 2016, only 22 percent were fully vaccinated. Thank you. Thank you for that follow-up information. Okay, I think we'll move on to the next session. Uh, Dr. McLean from Marshfield Clinic Research Institute will be presenting on interim estimates of flu vaccine effectiveness from two studies in Wisconsin. Thank you. Um, today I'm going to present the interim results from two concurrent ongoing studies that we are conducting um, at Marshfield Clinic on behalf of the study team. Dr. McLean, first, would you mind what? getting a little closer to the microphone? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's much clearer. Yes. Thank you. Okay. The first study is a test negative case control study that was funded by CSL Secures, and the second study is part of a community cohort funded by CDC. I will start with the test negative case control study. Next slide. So the methods of the test negative case control study are similar to what has been previously presented for the three CDC networks, except we recruited outpatients, including those who presented um, for COVID-19 testing, aged six months to 64 years with acute respiratory illness with cough of seven or fewer days duration. Data presented are from enrollments from December 2nd, 2022 through February 10th, 2023. Influenza vaccination was defined as documentation in the patient's health record of current season influenza vaccine receipt 14 or more days before illness onset, according to the ACIP recommendations. Vaccine effectiveness estimates um, were adjusted for age, month of illness onset, and presence of high risk conditions. Next slide. Okay. This slide shows the number of participants with PCR results on the left. Influenza cases are shown in the pink bars. COVID-19 cases are in navy, and those negative for both influenza and SARS-CoV-2 are in gray. Influenza positivity, shown with the pink line, was highest at the beginning of the enrollment period in December and has declined since. On the right is a distribution of influenza test results. 73% of viruses were H3N2, and 26% were H1N1 PDM09. All of the 43 characterized viruses were genetically similar to the vaccine components. Next slide. There were 545 patients with medically attended acute respiratory illness were included in this analysis. Among participants, 34% were vaccinated, 
of whom the majority, or 84%, received cell culture-based vaccine. The percentage vaccinated differed by sex, higher risk conditions, and COVID-19 vaccination status. Next slide. Among the 116 participants positive for influenza, 22% were vaccinated, compared to 37% of 429 participants who tested negative for influenza and SARS-CoV-2. The over-adjusted vaccine effectiveness against outpatient medically attended influenza A was 54%, with a 95% confidence interval of 23 to 73%. Vaccine effectiveness against influenza H3N2 viruses was 60%, with a 95% confidence interval of 25% to 79%. Next slide. Moving on to the prospective community cohort study. Next slide. So this is an ongoing community cohort in central Wisconsin of 241 children who have been followed weekly since September 5th, 2022. Each week, children or their guardians report the absence or presence of the following symptoms over the past seven days. Fever, cough, loss of smell or taste, sore throat, muscle or body aches, shortness of breath, diarrhea, nasal congestion or runny nose, or nausea or vomiting. New symptom onset prompts self or guardian collection of nasal swab for influenza and SARS-CoV-2 research testing. Other relevant information was collected from surveys and extracted from the electronic health record, including vaccination history and clinical influenza test results. Next slide. To estimate vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic influenza infection in the cohort, we use a cost proportional hazards model with time varying vaccination status. Person time at risk began October 23rd, 2022, which is seven days before the first case was identified and ended February 10th, 2023, or the date of influenza infection, whichever occurred first. Vaccinated person time began 14 days after receipt of the influenza vaccine. Unvaccinated person time was the time before receipt of influenza vaccine. And we censored the person time from the 13 days after receipt of influenza vaccine. An influenza case was defined as a positive influenza result from a research or clinical test during the, the at-risk period. Vaccine effectiveness was calculated as 1 minus the adjusted hazards ratio times 100%, where the hazards ratios represented the ratio of influenza infections in the vaccinated to unvaccinated person time. The model adjusted for age, higher risk condition, and COVID-19 vaccination. Next slide. Among the 241 children in the cohort, 39% were vaccinated, of which 84% received a cell culture-based vaccine and 65% received two or more doses of COVID-19 vaccine. And 34 children, or 14%, were positive for influenza. Next slide. The figure on the left shows the number of children with influenza infection in pink and SARS-CoV-2 in navy during the follow-up period. Influenza incidence was highest late November and early December and has declined since. 85% of influenza infections were caused by H3N2. We had one or 3% by H1N1, and the remaining were influenza A with unknown subtype. The six characterized H3N2 viruses in this population were similar or genetically similar to the vaccine component. Next slide. There were six influenza A infections during the 7,292 vaccinated person days of follow-up, resulting in an incidence of 0.82 infections per 1,000 person days. And 28 cases occurred during the 15,678 unvaccinated person days, resulting in an incidence of 1.79 infections per 1,000 person days. Vaccine effectiveness against symptomatic influenza A virus infection was 71%, with a 95% confidence in 31 to 90% among children in this cohort. Next slide. There are several limitations to consider for this, these studies. First, the two studies were conducted in a single geographic area, central Wisconsin. However, virus that predominated in the study population were similar to those that predominate across the U.S. Second, adults age 65 and older who generally have lower vaccine effectiveness estimates against H3N2 were excluded. Third, as small sample sizes, 
resulting in wide confidence intervals, and we could not estimate VE against H1N1 or by age groups. Finally, confounding and bias are concerned with observational studies. However, estimates were comparable across the two study designs. Next slide. To summarize, interim results indicate substantial vaccine-induced protection against influenza A during the current season. Vaccine effectiveness was 54% against medically attended influenza A in children and working age adults, and 71% against symptomatic infection in children. These estimates are consistent with reported estimates from the three CDC networks and in Canada, and consistent with a good vaccine match. All characterized viruses from the study population belong to the genetic same genetic subclade as the viruses included in the current season Northern Hemisphere influenza vaccine. Next slide. I'll finish by acknowledging the team that worked on these studies. The details of the study will be included in the MMWR report that will be published this week. And then, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. McLean. Um, these sets of presentations make me wish we were better at predicting every year what the match would be because these are some of the higher estimates I've seen in a very long time. Um, this presentation is now open for questions. Dr. Paling. Uh, thank you, Dr. McLean. I've got a question. Um, can you tell us the types of vaccines? I'm thinking I'm seeing on the slides that 84% received cell um, culture-based vaccine, is that correct? And can you tell us how much live attenuated and what, the vac what types of vaccines your populations um, received? Thank you. That's correct. Eighty majority of the, um, our members or patients received the um, cell-based vaccine. We had very few LAIV um, and then some recombinant vaccine. The, the majority of the other were the standard vaccine. Any additional questions? Oh, Dr. Chen, sorry. I think you might have to actually face your name to me. I can't see it on the angle. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I did have a question that uh, maybe you've mentioned and I missed it, but um, I'm looking at the epidemiologic curves for both the test negative case control and the prospective community cohorts, and it looks like that the test negative case control, the, your your testing only started in December. Was it just uh, that, that that started later, or was that the extent of when you started detecting flu positives by the test negative case control? Just again, trying to understand the intervals. Did you, did you miss maybe some uh, cases uh, in, the, in the test negative case control that were earlier? Yes. So for the cohort study, we were following them since September. For the test negative case control study, essentially we started when we could start. It was an early season. Uh, we know from um, surveillance data that there was some activity during the holidays, the, the Thanksgiving holidays. We, we likely missed a couple of weeks um, of the start of the flu season in our area. Dr. Lair. Thank you for your presentation. Can we go to slide 12, please? Um, the prospective cohort study intrigues me because I think it actually, if I'm doing my math right and thinking correctly, we can actually get a number needed to prevent an infection. So if we look at that, the incidence per 1,000 person days was 082 for the vaccinated and 1.79 for the unvaccinated would give you an approximate one per 1,000 person days. And that would be, if you take the three month flu season, you, you vaccinate 10 people and you might prevent one illness, um, if I'm doing my math approximately. And I'm wondering if I'm missing something because this is actually perspective. You're calling every week to check and see if they're sick. So you're probably not missing anybody and so that, that seems, that that's not something I, we usually see in the data where, where we can get a number needed to vaccinate. Am I missing something and is that accurate? Thank you.
Dr. Lara can do math faster in his head than I, I know. the rest of us. <laughs> I was <laughs> so. going to say, I, I, I haven't thought of it that way, but I think if um, I can look into it, we it's um, we do the, the, the participants do report every week their symptoms, and certain symptoms do trigger, and we also pull um, records from the clinical the clinic testing, um, but we do have some who tested positive in the clinic that did not report in our surveillance. So we we didn't, we, we probably missed some as well. Um, but if you think of your mass, I will look into this and um, it's an interesting way to look at that. But, but ignoring the math, it does seem that the, you're, you're having one fewer case per 1,000 person days based on this. Um, and that's a prospective study, so that's that's actually a thinking. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions in the room or in the Zoom room? Okay. Well, thank you very thank much you. for that presentation. And um, Dr. Groskoff, we have about twelve minutes. Do you? Would you like to go ahead and proceed with your LA, LAIB presentation? Okay. Um, feel free to go ahead and pull up your slides. And um, Dr. Groskoff uh, plans to give us a, a quick tour of published estimates of LA, LAIB live attenuated influenza vaccine effectiveness. Okay, thanks very much. I'm, I'm glad we had a couple of minutes to cover this. So this is a very brief update of published estimates. These are not CDC data, but they are published, and um, we'll discuss a little bit about the references. Um, uh, there are only two other slides besides this one. So um, we'll move on. I think I have to request control again. Forgive me. There we go. Okay. So before um, showing the chart of the published estimates, I just wanted to provide a bit of brief background since it's been a little bit of time since we discussed this topic. Um, LAIV4, the quadrivalent live attenuated influenza vaccine, um, was initially approved in the United States um, in 2012 and came into use during the 13-14 season after having had a trivalent formulation um, since 2003 in the United States. Um, LAIV4 was not recommended in the United States for use during the 2016-17 and 2017-18 seasons following observation of low effectiveness specifically against H1N1 PDM09 like viruses among children aged 2 through 17 years. That was noticed during the 13-14 season and during the 15-16 season, both of which had some H1N1 predominance. Thank you. Subsequent studies, um, it wasn't exactly clear what was going on when, it was, when this was first noticed. 13-14 um, was actually the first H1N1 predominant season that had occurred since um, the 2009 pandemic. Um, and it was also the first season the quadrivalent was available. However, subsequent studies suggested um, decreased replicative fitness of the LAIV4 H1N1 pdm 9 like vaccine virus. This is a live virus, so live virus vaccine uh, requires replication of the um, virus in the nasopharyngeal mucosa in order to be effective. Subsequently, after those studies evaluated um, the vaccine virus, that vaccine virus was updated and replaced in the vaccine. LAIV4 was again a recommended option in the United States starting in 2018-19 after discussion at the February 2018 ACIP meeting of um, three streams of data. One was a combined U.S. individual patient level VE analysis, which consisted of data from um, several U.S. sources, a systematic review of post-2009 U.S. and non-U.S. LAIV VE estimates, and metamune data um, in their studies of the new H1N1 pdm 9 like virus that um, indicated a better immunogenicity and fitness of that new virus. Unfortunately, subsequent LAIV4 use within the CDC US VE networks um, has been low since the 2018-19 season, which has precluded assessment of a vaccine-specific VE in the US from these networks. Um, so we have not presented one recently. However, LAIVV estimates have been published from non-U.S. observational studies, some of which are summarized on this next slide. Um, so in this slide, you're going to see a few colors. I'll just do some explaining first. 
Um, the estimates that have the blue dots are LAIV4 estimates. For comparison, um, we try to pull from the same papers where available either IIV, inactivated vaccine quadrivalent um, VE estimates, or if such were not available, estimates for all vaccines. Um, these are all for children. The age groups do vary a little bit. Um, so some of that's in the legend at the bottom of the slide. VE expressed as a present is on the x-axis. On the y-axis, we have some descriptive information on the source of each estimate. Again, where possible, we strove to get a, um, a comparable estimate from the same paper. The boxes around the information on the x-axis indicate estimates that come from the same publication, and you'll see the references on the right. Starting with Finland, um, LAIV4 estimates for two through six-year-olds are shown alongside IIV4 estimates for six month through six-year-olds um, in um, countries where it's licensed. LAIV4 is generally licensed for two years and older, so hence the age difference. For 2018-19, these estimates were 36% for LAIV4 and 54% for IIV4. For 1920, they're 68 and 71% respectively. For the United Kingdom, the 2018-19 estimated LAIV VE was 49% for two through 17-year-olds, similar to the estimate for all vaccines in this age group of 53%. In 1920, the estimated LAIV4 VE of 45% uh, was reported, while in 2021-22 was 72%. The two estimates on the far right in 2021-22 for Denmark are both shown in green. Those are the 64 and the 63 percent that you see all the way over on the right. Green does denote um, all vaccines. However, this paper makes note um, that those in the two through six-year-old age group, um, which are the age groups represented by these estimates, were offered um, LAIV4, and 92 percent of them received that. Others received inactivated vaccines. So this is, these are really predominantly LAIV4 estimates. Um, and those came in at 64% um, for the non-hospitalized children and 63% for the hospitalized children. So again, these are, these are published estimates. Um, you can find more information in the references. Um, there are three that come, four rather, that come from published papers. Um, references four and five are publications from Public Health England um, for their summary of VE reports. And that is, ends this update on this topic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Groskoff. Um, this presentation is open for questions. Dr. Lair. So speaking as someone who's been looking for this data for a long time, I really appreciate you summarizing it and putting it before us. I think it's very helpful and useful for my colleagues to wonder. It's a question I get every year is how effective is LAIV versus IIV? And this is a great, great answer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Long. Seeing these um, percent efficacy and effectiveness and the variation in the, in the outcomes across different group studies, although there's a theme, um, it strikes me we learned from COVID for sure that we have to define the outcome we're talking about. So I, I assume when you're talking about effectiveness against influenza, effectiveness, not efficacy. Effectiveness, you just mean medically attended febrile respiratory tract illness? Is that the outcome? The, the methods vary a little bit across studies. Um, here we have, um, there is case control and cohort data. The, the Finnish data comes from a national cohort study. Um, they are lab confirmed. However, there's some differences in the testing. For example, um, one of the characteristics of the, the Finnish cohort study data is that it's not necessarily PCR. So they tend to result the, report the results out from those data as only influenza A or B with no subtyping um, because it's largely, I believe, clinician-directed testing, not, not specified. So it, it, it is definitely a valid point that um, measures and definitions and criteria do vary um, in these different studies. And also we do have variability. There are three different seasons represented here. Um, as with anything with flu, you know, the match varies from season to season. Um, so we, we, we expect to see some variability. Um, however, in the, in the previous period of time, um, just for reference, when the combined US patient level data analysis um, was presented at ACIP, and this included data from um, two different CDC sources, flu VE network, and um, the Influenza Incident Surveillance Project, as well as from DOD, MedImmune, and Louisiana State University. 
um, all U.S. estimates um, from the 13, 14, through 15, 16 seasons, so three seasons. Um, depending on age group, the VE estimates ranged from about 20 to 34 percent, and many were not statistically significant at that time. So um, we expect variability. We try to, to combine data across seasons where we can. Um, we unfortunately can't do that with these data since they're not ours. Um, but there, there is a valid point that there are, there are going to be variations in methods, especially among observational studies. I hope, I hope that's helpful. And, and do I detect a theme here also that for this vaccine, it is unlike coronavirus vaccine in that it doesn't seem to protect better against worse outcomes. It's, it may be a little bit different for acute respiratory illness and hospitalization, but not as dramatically. Uh, it, do you think that that's real, or is that the way we are investigating people, or what, what's your thought about that? I am not completely certain, honestly, of the answer to that question. Um, much of the data on prevention of severe outcomes, um, from my familiarity, focuses more on influenza vaccines broadly. I'm less familiar with specific LAIV data, though I would be happy to look that up and, and return with any information I can find. And then in reference to Dr. Cotton's earlier observation that maybe the decrease to hospitalizations this year, it could be a virus that's not as virulent, could be testing, it could be treatment. And I think there is no question that a continuous moving target is testing. So this year, children who had an illness were all tested because they wanted to know, did they have coronavirus and did they have to stay home for five days or 10 days? Or did they have influenza and they could be treated or they could go back when they weren't febrile? So it's really going to affect the denominators and what disease you're, what the outcome is you're testing with vaccine effectiveness. So it, I, I still don't quite, I, I have the sense that it doesn't perform as well as, as coronavirus vaccines, although they're very short-lived, um, very short-lived now. Um, but I'm not sure I, I, I know mm -hmm. the true vaccine effectiveness of influenza vaccines because the outcomes keep changing and the denominators are changing. Well, just to clarify, unless I misheard the last presentation did we speak. We can't quite hear you, Grace. Um, just to clarify, no one ever tells me that, Dr. Long. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I believe, unless I misunderstood, the last presentation really fo focused on symptomatic uh, flu infection and not just hospitalizations and ED visits. So to me, that was really nice data to be able to view, uh, recognizing that it was in pediatrics. But um, your point about testing is an interesting one, because I've actually heard the opposite, which is that people, because they have COVID testing at home, are less likely to go to their doctor. Um, of the ones that go, they're getting multiplex testing. Um, so we get maybe more complete coverage of the ones that go to the healthcare delivery system and others are not going. Um, it does beg the question of the challenges we will face as um, more uh, point of care diagnostics move into the home setting, how to be able to continue to conduct meaningful surveillance and sort of grappling with those challenges, given that we need a lot of this data to be able to continue to ensure that the benefit risk balance of uh, prevention programs and you know treatment, if you're in the clinical arena, uh, continue to make sense. And so I, I do think that um, the question you raised about diagnostics is an important one we should start to think about incorporating. I want to give the floor to Ms. McNally for the last question, um, and then we'll close this session. Thank you. It's not really a question. Uh, it is more of a comment to just say that I hope that where this information regarding vaccine effectiveness is published for the public, that the LAIV information is also included, because I think a lot of parents have questions and would like to see this information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank all of our speakers for um, today's influenza session. It was an excellent series of presentations. Um, and we will now take a 10-minute break and return at 2 o'clock. It's a nine-minute break for a public comment. Thank you, everyone.